So it's sort of, it plays into gematria, which is dealing with numbers and how to, how to get meanings out of numbers. So the ancient Hebrew did not have vowel points, so therefore there weren't words. You know, like we have a real common word that's in most all religions, and that's the word Jehovah. And that word Jehovah comes from the, the Hebrew glyphs. Uh, I'll just put them on the board. It's called the Yod, Hey, Vav, Hey. And that, those glyphs, Yod, Hey, Vav, Hey, Hebrew going from right to left, backwards from English. Yod, Hey, Vav, Hey, we put vowel points in there, A, E, I, O, or U, and we created a word called Jehovah. That word doesn't exist in ancient Hebrew. That's a made-up word. It would be like if I said, what's H2O? Water. It's, you'd say water. And I'd say, is that a word? You'd say, no, it's not a word. Why? It's a formula. Well, see, that's how the Hebrew glyphs were. This is not a word. This is a formula. So what is this a formula? It's the formula for fire, air, water, and oxygen. Which, if you look on the earth, everything on the earth comes from that fire, air, water and oxygen and so and so the so the Hebrew did not have valve points now they added valve points so that they could make it into a language and you know put, you could try to speak it but originally when they say that it's that you can't pronounce it y'all have heard that haven't you see in pronounce because but what they did in religion we said we can't pronounce it because it's too holy to say it that wasn't true it had nothing to do with being too holy to say you can't pronounce it because it's not a word and so in the, like for instance, Genesis 1, 1, Barashit, Bara, in et Elohim, in et Shamayim, in et Iretz. Now, that's how with vowel points we could say that. But now if I spelled it out in, in these Hebrew glyphs just across and begin to interpret each one of the glyphs for you, it'd be a completely different than in the beginning God created heaven and earth. In other words, it wouldn't say that. And so you could actually say, really what it's saying is the combination of shamayim, which is a, the Hebrew word that we translated for heaven, which actually means waters above and waters below. Because everything in this material world exists because of water. If there wasn't no water, there wouldn't be nothing here. So you're, you yourself are made up mostly of water. You're called a water vessel. So you are the same as Moses, Moses being a type of you. Moses, Moshe, Mim, Shin, Hay means drawn up out of water. And basically, that's what you and I are. So that's, that's just a, kind of an overview. But where I'm going this morning is going to be a, a, a journey. <laughs> you, have to, you just have to hold tight and uh, listen closely. And so I'm going to read it from this book. It's called Emerald Tablets. And the Emerald Tablets was discovered in uh, 1790 or something like that. And they have kind of been a, uh, a stone to shake the foundations of what's mostly called Christianity. No, it doesn't matter what group of Christians you, you're from. The Emerald Tablet has kind of shook, shook that. So I just want to read you a portion of it. And uh, you can just listen to it. If it resonates, fine. If it don't, then that's okay. Put it on the side. Know ye not, O man, of your heritage? And I would answer that and say, no, you don't. <laughs> you know why we don't? Because it's been manipulated, twisted, and so we don't really know unless we do a lot of research and go back several thousand years, not just hundreds of thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Know ye not, O man, your heritage? Know ye not? You are truly light. Now, most people don't know that. But see, if you go back to the ancient Hebrew, in the Old Testament scriptures, especially Genesis, because it lays the foundation, if you go back, you, you, you've all heard that you were formed. You all heard, heard that word form, Yitzhah, in Hebrew, Yitzhah, Yitzhah. You were all formed out of the, what, dust. That's what most translations say. Well, the word dust is afar in Hebrew, afar. And the word afar means particles of light. So even today in modern science and biology can prove you're a light vessel. They even can prove you everything in you exists. You're an electrical being. 
Your brain is working right now. And you know, as I speak, as I'm saying right now, your synapses are firing. There's an electrical storm going on inside your brain because I'm saying things and you're having to think. So that thought does what? Creates a lot of electricity in your brain. So you are a fire vessel. Now we don't know that. We haven't been told that because we have been told we were made out of mud, dirt, lower things of the earth. It doesn't say that. It says that you were formed out of, out of you were formed yitzah or squeezed out of particles of light, fire. So as God is light, you are the offspring of that, you're light. So this, this is what the Emerald Tablets is saying. He said, Know ye not, O man of your heritage, know ye not truly that you are truly light. Son, S-U-N, of the great Son, S-U-N, when you, when you gain wisdom, truly aware of your kinship with the light. So here he's saying, it's like the book of Proverbs. When you read the book of Proverbs, the book of Proverbs' main thrust is this. Its main thrust is getting gold and silver. Why? Because gold and silver gives you wealth, the ability to do anything that you want to do. But gold and silver are only typologies of wisdom and knowledge. Because if you don't get wisdom and knowledge, then the key there is knowledge. If without knowledge, people perish. Without knowledge, people are held in captivity. That's Hosea and Isaiah. Both of them say that. And that's exactly what we have today. We have an epidemic of knowledge. Now we have a lot of knowledge of religion, but that religion basically builds walls and puts you inside those walls and then out of the result of that you say, well I believe this. And that's just a normal response. Why? Because it's something you've been taught to believe. It doesn't really have a lot to do with knowledge, it has a lot to do with beliefs. And I call beliefs boxes. And I say about the boxes, they're the boxes that you're in. God's not in that box. God's bigger than that box. And God thinks outside that box. And most people I know believe something different than they believed 10 years ago. Especially if they're progressive or if they're expanding or if their knowledge is growing. Because that knowledge will get you over and above and beyond your box. It just does, doesn't it? And I can quote a lot of different religious beliefs that people have had and, and, and just really embraced it one time and held on to it dearly. And then they got expanded knowledge. They said, I don't believe that anymore. <laughs> and so, so beliefs are boxes that we put ourselves into. So he says, now, now to you, to ye, I give knowledge, freedom to walk in the path that I have trod, showing you truly how by my striving I trod the path that leads to the stars. The stars are symbols of light, which are symbols of knowledge. So when you're looking at scripture and you're talking about the light, you're talking about knowledge. When you're looking at darkness, you're talking about ignorance. And Paul wrote constantly, I think he said either five or seven times in his epistles, Paul said, I wish you wasn't ignorant. The flip side of that is you are ignorant. <laughs> and he wasn't saying it disrespectfully. He was just saying, you know what ignorance just means? I just don't know. I mean, I, you know, when it comes to these cell phones and these computers and all this electronic equipment, I, I claim ignorance. I don't know, and, I, and you know, I've had people go, oh, well, you need to take a computer course. And I said, I don't have time to take a computer course. I'm taking a Hebrew course, and it <laughs> observes all of my time that I have to study. So, but, so I choose to be ignorant when it comes to computers and things. So ignorance is not a bad thing. I'm not saying you're stupid. I'm just saying we're ignorant. But when it comes to the things, there's, good, there's pure religion, as the book of James said, and then there's religion that binds us up. Most of us are full of that. Most of us have more of that than we can possibly do, do with it. I mean, we have an abundance of the religion that binds us up. So he says, Hark ye, O man, and know of your bondage. Know how to free yourself from the toils. Out of the darkness shall you rise upward, one with the light and one with the stars. Follow ye ever the path of wisdom. Only by this can you rise from below. Every man's destiny leads him onward into the curves of the infinite all. So that little book, I, I like to read some stuff out of that because it puts, uh, puts a lot of thoughts in our minds. I want to put a couple of things on the board. This is a character I created here about uh, 
about 20 or 25 years ago, and I called him my stick man. And actually what, what he represents are the endocrine glands that build a physical body in the womb of your mother. So your body is built from seven endocrine glands, and you can, you can read that. You can get a medical dictionary and look it up if you like. Seven endocrine glands, and within the first uh, few, just within the first few hours, the first thing that begins to form in the womb of your mom after the seed, by the way, the seed of a man, one of the particles of that seed is light. A lot of people don't know that, but you start out as the seed of your father, light. I mean, literally, electrical light. Fire, fire, light, same thing. And so one of the things that begins to form before anything else is what's called a little gray matter right up here. You know what that gray matter is, don't you? That gray matter is your upper brain. Uh, it's called your cerebrum. Cere, if I'm going to the Old Testament scriptures, cere is a word, or Sarah, Sarah. Brum is another word, Abram. So Sarah and Abram are a typology of your cerebrum. Now, you know, so a lot of things that I will have to say, and I try to validate these things if I can, there is, there is only the word wife used one time in the Old Testament Scripture. Only one time is the word wife. Even though in the English translation, I don't care which translation you use it, in the English translations, if the word, you'll see the word wife, gosh, you'll see it probably 50 to 100 times or more. But it's not the Hebrew word. It's the Hebrew word esha. Now, and the word esha actually is referring to the female I-S-H-A-H, -H, Asha, and it's spelled with the Alif, Sheen, get that where, where you can see it on that board, the Alif, the Sheen, and the Hay. Now that's how you would spell this word, Asha, and it's referring to the feminine. Like for instance in Genesis chapter 2 when it talks about man and woman, the word woman is Asha. Okay? It's not Eve. It's referring to the female side. And actually this word in Hebrew, Asha, means feminine fire. Okay? And it comes from this word, Ash, which is the male. It's the male side of your brain. Or you could call it, you could call it, and you would be, it would be okay if you wanted to call it the spirit side of your brain. It's, it's where all of the, it's where all the thoughts, it's where the light, it's where all that comes. It doesn't matter if it's positive or negative, it doesn't matter. You know, have you ever thought where the thoughts come from? Where they, where's, you know, thoughts are, they're like a fish in a, in a river, aren't they? <laughs> you get good ones and bad ones, don't you? I mean, I do. Maybe I better talk about me. I do. I get good ones and bad ones. Where did that thought come from? Wow, that was that was a uh, that was a catfish, a bottom feeder. It was a <laughs> it was a trash fish. You know? But they're all kind. Of Ezekiel. Look at the book. The book of Ezekiel is about man. The sad thing is, the whole Bible is about man, but we didn't realize it. It is completely. It's about the temple, the tabernacle, the house of God that God built without the sound of a hammer or without a saw in the belly of your mom. Nobody could hear it, nobody knew it, but God was building his temple. And Paul said it very clearly, do you not know that you are the temple, the house, the home where God lives? I'm mean, sad, it tells you that very clear and plain, but you know, we just skirt over that. We don't, we don't grasp it, we don't understand it. Why? We have been religiously inundated with these beliefs. So. These characters right here, male and female, Ash and Asha, go all through the Old Testament Scripture. And many times they'll take the Hebrew word Asha and they'll translate it for the word wife. Many times they'll take the word Asha and translate it for the Hebrew word, or for the English word woman. So every time that you see woman or wife, almost every time in the Old Testament it's Asha, which actually means the womb of fire. So it's the female side of your brain that's made to incubate the thoughts so that you can take those thoughts 
and use those thoughts in words, and words are like seeds. Peter says that the word is the it's the sperma. He uses the Greek word sperma. And the word sperma is where we get the English word sperm, seed. What does a seed do? It has a potential to create and grow something. So what happens to you? If you take a seed, you put that seed in the soil of the earth or in the environment where that seed can grow, and what will it do? Grow. It will sprout and grow. It'll create, that's the way words are. So when you say words that you wish you hadn't said, you can't draw them back because they went out. But thank God some of them fall on stony ground. They don't grow nothing, right? <laughs> some of them are choked up by the cares of the world. Thank God because a lot of them, don't you? you know, it's like a lot of times men and women get into arguments or get into discussions or things. And they say things because they're upset or they're hurt or whatever. And then they, I, I do or I have. You know? So I, I have to put a guard you know, didn't the book of James said that uh, the tongue is what? Like the rudder of a ship. It's a very small member, but does what? It'll turn the helm of a massive thing. And, and that's true. And so we, we, don't, we don't understand these things because we haven't been taught. It's not that we can't understand. We can, but we haven't been taught. And so it comes back to teaching. So I created this character. I call him the stick man. It comes from the Greek word. Actually, I did an exegesis of the book of Revelation 25 years ago. And in that exegesis of the book of Revelations, I took the seven churches. This is the same thing. The seven churches are the same as the seven endocrine glands. Because the word church comes from two Greek words. Ek, E-X, or E-K, can be spelled either way. And kleo, or klesia. And the word ek means point, or place, cross points, and kleo means the, uh, the ability or the energy, the electricity to create a word. So ecclesia, we call we got translated for the word church. And then it's not used that many times in the New Testament scriptures. It's only used once, I think, maybe twice by Jesus. It wasn't something that he started. He was just using it as a phrase, talking about these cross points of energy. And so every, in your physical body, these endocrine glands, they come together as the cross points of energy to give you life or you would live. And how do they do that? They do that through the breath, ruach. That's what it says, Genesis 1-2. And the spirit, that's the Hebrew word, ruach, moved, the wind moved upon the earth. Paul said, don't you know you are earthen vessels? What's the first thing a baby does when he comes out? When the, when the house has been built, God said it's time to deliver it, and he pushes the house out into this dimensional world, what's the first thing it has to have? Breath. What's the last thing it leaves it? Breath. So what is that? That's God. God is breath. God is spirit. I mean, Scripture said, doesn't it say, God is spirit? So what was moving on the face of the earth? The God was. How? It's the wind, the breath. And so the first thing that child needs, why? That breath is the fire, it's the electricity, it's God. Without that, you have no life. When that leaves, life leaves you. It's, it's not complicated, it's real simple. But it's, uh, it's, every bit of it's biological, every bit of it's anatomical. The whole of scriptures, that all of the characters are that way. You know, it's amazing for me in all of my years of study and research that they've never found one historical character and prove that it was there. Never. Not one. But if they would go back, I remember my 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 Bible teacher when I did seminary work, gosh, back in 76, 77, 78, 79, Finest Jennings Day was my Bible teacher. And he was uh, he was one of very few men. He had the whole Bible memorized. So he, he was phenomenal. He was just a phenomenal teacher. When I met him, he was getting on up in the years. He was in his 80s and uh, still a very strong, vibrant man. And I actually emceed the last public meeting that he ever that he ever did before he died. But anyway, during the, during the classes, I would say, Brother Dave, that don't make sense to me. <laughs> I would just shout out because I was real rambunctious when I was a young man and had no fear. And so I just said, I don't understand that. That don't make sense. He said, oh, come for it. And you'll learn the rest of it when you get to heaven. And I said, I don't want to wait till then. <laughs> I don't know now. 
And, it, and I, said, I quoted him back. I said, but you, ta you tell me the Scripture says that, the, that God will show the prophets the things that they want to know. Don't fool me, Lee. You want, you'll learn later. <laughs> so, these things are all available for us. Well, this thick man, uh, put some legs on this character. Um, and this is... Uh, You're made up of uh, light and darkness. You're made up of upper and lower. You're made up of female and male. You're made up of heaven and earth. I mean, all of these dichotomies, you're made up of good and evil. In Hebrew, the word ra, which means left, is the same as the word translated for evil. And the word tov, which is the word translated for good, is the word for right. So how many of you have a left? How many? <laughs> evil, evil. How many of you have a right? Yes. Good, good. So you're a dichotomy of good and evil. Now, religion has come along and perverted that. We, did, we didn't know what to do with it, so we made all evil of this character we call the devil. He was a, he was a, but Isaiah says very clearly that God's the one that's behind good and evil. God created good and evil. Does that real clear, I think, in the book of Isaiah. So we have these things that we get so confused on simply because, again, religion has come along and we have lost the true identity of who we are. And so it's coming back to that place where as you find out who you are, you'll begin to realize as God is light, I am a vessel of that light. I could say it this way. As God is fire, because light is fire, then I'm a vessel of fire. And that, and that works very clearly with these Hebrew words, ash and asher, male and female, man and woman. So uh, if you have a Bible and you want to look at me with these scriptures, go with me to the book of Isaiah. Just find that opening there, Isaiah. And look at chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43. Okay. Everybody there? Now what is this? This, this is the heart, the center. What, and I did that on purpose. What, what does that look like to y'all? That's the yin and yang. Exactly. See? Yin and yang. That's, that's, uh, that's exactly what that is. And the reason that I, I do it that way is because the upper portion of your body, your anatomy, the upper portion from your heart, your cardia, that thing that pumps the blood from your heart up is called the vessel or the part of you that's light. And from your heart down, your lower down through your sex organ and your legs, your lower extremity, is called darkness. Or you can actually say up here is where good is and down here is where evil is. And, and I'm not saying that but based off right or wrong at all. Not at all. When they are proportional, when we understand the key to all of it is balance. I mean, the key to every bit of it is balance. As a matter of fact, every bit of this living entity, which you are, sets right here on this thing that's called a pelvic bone. And your pelvic bone, if I'm doing astrology, if I'm building an astrological wheel, which is a circle with a cross in it, and I start with all of the different astrological um, signs. I start with Aries. Aries is a picture of, it is a symbol of the head. And that's exactly what it looks like. It looks like the head. Taurus is a symbol of the neck and the shoulders. Gemini is a symbol of your two arms the twins, you understand? Cancer is a symbol of your two lungs. Leo is a symbol of your heart. Virgo is a symbol of your womb, your intestine. And Libra is a symbol. What is Libra? It's in every courtroom. What is Libra? They, they do it like this, they come over. Is that how they do it? And what do they call it? They call it this, which is wrong. 
They call it judgment when they should call it this. Balance. Because do you call your pelvic bone judgment? <laughs> no. No. You see, you see how I'm standing right now? I'm leaning to the to my right. So what am I? I'm off balance. Now does that mean there's something bad wrong with me? No, I'm just saying. Do you realize you can't walk without being out of balance? Because you're leaning one way or the other. So if that, if that should never have been called judgment, it should always because the astrological sign is a sign of what's called the Adam Kidmon. We call it the God Man in the Sky. So it, it, the ancient mythology, the Hermetic philosophy, as above, so below, as without, so within. As man is in the sky, man is in this physical world. It's not any different. So everything in the astrological wheel is a picture of this guy right here, the physical body. Okay, it's the same thing. It says the same thing. So in ancient Hebrew, when you get into Hermetic philosophy, you get into astrology, you get into a lot of these different things, they all were talking about the physical anatomy, the physical body, and how it functions and how it works. So you, and if you'll notice, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, isn't that amazing? And of course, these signs down here have to do with your thigh, uh, you get Capricorn, your knees, all the way back around to Pisces, your two feet. Isn't that amazing? It's all perfect, all accurate, it's all there. Always been there. It's just knowing how to see it, just knowing how to understand. These are the different functions of my physical body. So when I did the exegesis and the revelations on the seven churches, I come up with this character called the stick man, which is the same thing as the seven endocrine glands. You get over into Revelations chapter 4, and it talks about the throne, the throne room, the throne, sitting around the throne were the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. This is called the 12 pair cranial nerve because that's exactly what you're coming off. You have coming off your ash, your male side of your brain. You have 12 major nerves that comes around into the cranial, into the back of your neck, your torus. And on the female side, you have 12, there's your, 20, there's your 24 elders sitting around the throne in the house of God, in the heavens. Very clear, very easy to understand. It's about the physical anatomy and how it works and how it functions. Because as you begin to see how it works and functions, there's all kinds of things going on in your body right now. Right now. And, and I, I'm going to say this. Uh, may get into it, may not, I don't know. I'll try to see how far I can. We're wearing masks today for mostly a non-sensual political reason. But part of that non-sensual political reason that we do wear the mask is we don't want to spread something, right? We, don't, we want to keep from spreading this virus. However, I pray you can hear me real closely because this is very difficult to say without doing weeks or months of teaching. If our immune system is where our immune system should be, there's not a one of us that a coronavirus can live or be or even put you down, period. Because your immune system will conquer it. It will overcome that virus. The flu will be harder to get rid of than coronavirus will be. Why? Because your immune system will do one thing. It will be adversary to that virus. And if that virus comes into your body, something foreign, an enemy has come into the temple, the house of God. And do you think God left your house to where you cannot defend yourself? Absolutely not. He gave you and me an immune system. And if we do not build that immune system, if we don't make that immune system strong, if we weaken it by our lifestyle, by a lot of other different things, then a virus can come in and do damage to our body. Now, if that immune system is working and it's strong and it's doing what it should be doing, that virus, uh, it'd be like Trump. You knock it out in a day or two. And, you know, he added a few, a few things that they have found to, that will combat it. But just simply say, all of the things that I just said, I can validate them through Scripture multiple, multiple ways. And, and I may be able to do that some. But let's look here in Isaiah 43 with me. 
Verse 5, it's, the first thing it says is what? Fear not. Isaiah 43, 5. That's the first thing it says is fear not. Well, what do you think that the media is doing to the entire world right now? The most people in the world, the largest portion of people in the world right now are living their life in fear. Fear of what? Think about it. What are we so afraid of? You know, we're even taught to be afraid of God in the, in the Christian community or in many circles of Christianity. They want you to be afraid of God. When the Scripture says very clearly that God is love and perfect love gets rid of all fear. So God doesn't use fear as a tool to manipulate us, to draw us, or to try to con us to do something. But we, we get caught by that, don't we? Uh, yeah, I remember years ago when I was trying to learn how to be a preacher. I thought, well, am I going to learn to hack? <laughs> I said, no, I can't learn to do that. I get choked up on <laughs> it. I remember, I remember, gosh, I was just a young preacher. I hadn't been preaching. I hadn't even been preaching a year. I went up in the mountains to what they called uh, decoration. Is yeah, that what y'all call it? Decoration? Yes. That's where they went out and they decorated all the graves of the dead folks. And everybody come on that Sunday. And they got the best hollering, hacking preacher they could get. And they put a big meal out there and they'd turn that preacher loose for 30 minutes, 45, or whatever, however how long he could. <laughs> and he's like, oh my God, he's going to die. And that was my first time to be exposed to that. And... Uh, <clears throat> I went to that went to that meeting and that preacher, I, he was an older gentleman. I thought, man, he's going to die up there. He's just about to choke himself to death. And I'm sitting up here, young preacher, and I thought, what, we can, what are we going to do? We need to calm him down. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, after it was all over, uh, Connie's aunt come to me. It was her church. She come to me. She said, how did you like that, Lynn? I said, well, I didn't understand it. She said, it sure was good, wasn't it? And I said, I don't know. What did he say? She said, I don't know, but it was really good. <laughs> I said, and such is church. As such is the definition of church. People go there. What did they say? I don't know, but it was good. <laughs> I don't think it should be that way, folks. I think that you should bring your brain in and not leave it in the car. I think you should bring your thoughts in with you and ability, you should have an ability to think. And I even encourage people, I said, hey, if I say something that's so bizarre, I don't care if you raise your hand or just say, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, we have people talk out and I have, I have people on the monthly CD that say, don't tell them not to bother you when you're on a thought and you're preaching or saying something. They just interrupt and say this and that and the other. And I said, well, I have given them a liberty to do that, to either inject or to ask the question because I think that's where the freedom is at. So I, some people don't like it. Some people do like it. But uh, anyway, it, it keeps, keeps us open. So the first word we look at here is fear not. You know, I think that would be a good message for the whole world today is don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of this corona. You know, I would ask people, get off of national media. Get off of CNN or MSNBC or CBS. Get off those TV programs, cut the thing off, and do some research yourself. You can find out yourself. If you just get on there and you, you get outside that box, you can find the truth. You can find out what's going on truly with the corona because the, the numbers are jacked through the roof. It's ridiculous. I mean, it really is ridiculous, but that's, that's just a whole nother platform to preach on. So I, I don't even need to be there, right? That's, that's political. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your seed from the, from the east, and I will gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends. Everybody say ends. Ends. Everybody say this, absolute. 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 That's the Hebrew word. That word means absolute. It means this right here. No, no thingness. Not nothing, no thingness. 
That word absolute means nothing. It means that you, can, you can't put your finger on anything that it is because it is everything that is. Now, what would that be called? Well, if we reduce that down, we would probably call that God, which actually comes from this word right here in the Hebrew, A-Y-N, Ayin, Ayin. means the same thing, no thingness. So, that's it. so here's what he's saying. This is absolute. And I want you to see what he's saying from the ends, from the absolute. And uh, verse 7, it says, Every one that is called by my name, for I have, I have what? Created. Created. Everybody say, Bariah. 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 Make a beautiful name for a girl. Bariah. And actually that word just means to create. Bariah. It's, it's like if I said Barashit Barar, that would be in the beginning God created Bara. That's the that's a shortened form of Baraya. Same word. And that's what it means. It actually means create. And there's there's four levels. Really, I'm I'm breaking this down. I'm just breaking this character down right here into four levels. And these four levels, one, two, three, four are listed right here. And this the first one is absolute. That's the no thingness. You know, have you ever figured out where your thoughts come from? You can't. You can't. They just come. Don't they? Yes. They just there. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you can have certain situations happen in your life and all of a sudden the worst thoughts in the world has just come from. Where did that come from? <laughs> Why in the world am I thinking that? Right? Yeah. If you get a little bit, of, little bit more truth, a little light, a little more light, you're like, well, that's stupid to think like that. But I do. Mm. Now, I'm talking about me. So if it shoe fits, then okay. Mm -hmm. So that's the absolute. Then God says, I have created. I, call, I, I have created for my glory. Mm -hmm. I have formed. Everybody say, Yitzhara. Yitzhara. That's the same word, Genesis 2 7. God formed. That's the word Yitzhara. And actually it just means to, to put together. That's what God did in the womb of your mama. He put you together. He formed you. He, Yitzhara. He built his house. That's exactly what he did. That's what that word means. Formed him. Yea, I have made him. Asiah. Asiah. Can y'all say that? Asiah. And that's exactly what he means. He said, I have I have out of nothing, mm -hmm. I have pulled every, I, actually, another word for this would be this word right here. And if you, uh, I had mentioned, I had mentioned Walter Russell to Glenn, and uh, Walter Russell wrote a book, and it is still, actually it still is a foundational book for all quantum science today. And that, that book's the best thing that you can call God is space. But see, we want to make God a man like we are. We want to have God be an old gray-headed man, you know, with a long beard. But the scripture tells you very clearly, Deuteronomy, that God is not a man. It tells you very well, matter of fact, let's just do this, just real quickly. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 4. I will, uh, you can find that. Just kind of a side, side trail here. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Did you find that? Everybody there? Look at verse 4. Oh, 24, I'm sorry. Look at verse 24, chapter 4. Everybody look at it. You found it? It says, For the Lord your God is what? Consuming fire. Oh, I thought that hell was where there was a consuming fire. No, that's where God is. God is a consuming fire. Psalms 46 says, God is the Son, S-U-N. Yeah. That's what it said. Hebrews, the book of Hebrews in the New Testament says the same identical thing right here. Quotes this. It says God is the consuming fire. Well, that word fire in Greek is the Greek word pur, P-U-R. We get our English word pure, P-U-R-E, from that word. 
So what is this fire that is God? This fire that is God is the fire that is ash, male, the light, that that causes your synapse, that electrical fire that's inside your brain. That's God. That's exactly what's doing all that in there. And then the female side of your brain, which is the esha, which is the womb for that fire. And it's called the womb of fire. Now, that, this is physical anatomy. It, the scripture is full of this physical anatomy. That's all it's about. Because, I, you know, I tell everybody, it's not a history book. It's a biological book. It's an, it's an anatomical book. It's a book about the physical anatomy, how you've been put together, and how you have been so marvelously, so wonderfully made. Psalms 136 tells you that. It says you are like a garment. You're like a cloth that's woven out of seven beautiful colors. Seven one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven beautiful colors. Same thing as the seven golden candlestick, which is fire. Same thing as the seven colors of the rainbow, which is fire. <laughs> you get that everywhere. Everywhere you turn, every way you look, it's there. Now, go with me to the book, book of Job. I love the book of Job. Uh, I actually I did an exegesis on the book of Job years ago. I used to take my Wednesday night services here. Actually, I did that actually when you come west 25 years ago, when you and Jan used to come up on through the week. I would do the, and I don't know where Steve's at today. I just never thought about Steve. He was going to be here today. But anyway, Job. I did an exegesis on the book of Job. And uh, let me just uh, let me just read you this out of the book of Job real quickly. Job had three friends that he had this, this convoluted conversation with. Okay? I, I, you get what I just said? Job had these three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. He had these three friends. He had this convoluted conversation with them. And, the, and two-thirds of the book of Job is what they responded to Job about what he called his dilemma. That, that, that's what they said. And so... At the end of the book of Job, and most preachers never read this. It's sad that they do. I've heard so many sermons so far off the wall out of the book of Job. Poor old Job. Y'all going to be just like old Job. Going to lose your wife. Going to lose your kids. Going to you know, just going to lose everything. Just have to be like old Job. Just be humble. Don't say nothing. <laughs> Bull. <laughs> Bull. Uh-uh. Look at this. The very end of the book, Job chapter 42. Okay, Job 42, verse 7. And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to, look here. Now this is God speaking to Job's friends. Eliphaz, the Temanite, my wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me the things that are right. Who? So that means that two-thirds of the book of Job, that's what his friend said. That's exactly what it does. It goes into this conversation, this dialogue. And his friend said, well, here's what I'd do. This is what God would do if he was in your situation. And preachers preach that. And it tells you very clearly, God says, think God didn't say anything about me. They didn't tell you of my nature. They didn't tell you what I thought. They told you what they thought. Sad to say that preachers don't read that. It's very clear if you read it. You have not spoken to me the things that is right as my servant Job hath. So go with me to Job chapter 2, beginning of the book where all this starts. And I want to look at a word. I put this word on the board. And this word on the put up here on the board is spelled sheen. Sheen in Hebrew is, is has to do with breath. It's next to the last lip in the 22 characters. It has to do with the breath. Taut is number nine. It has to do with feminine energy. It's the perfect number. If y'all any of y'all ever done anything or just Google it, look up number nine. Number nine is a phenomenal number. It just you can do all, all kinds of multiply, divide, do whatever, you come right back to nine. 
but the, the number nine taught in Hebrew actually is feminine energy and it just means it's self-propelling energy that constantly reproduces itself. And then the final non, which is a, uh, has to do with uh, uh, the 300, goes back into the, uh, into the 100, so it has to do with the, the final glyphs, and it has, has to do with the energy that's perpetual. So that word, shin, tov, non, got translated for this word. Satan. And there is actually no English word for Satan because Satan is the Hebrew word. So that's one of those words that just got transliterated. So they didn't really concoct an English word. They just used the, the Hebrew word. It's, it's just like Ararat. Mount Ararat, everybody's heard of that? Well, that's the Hebrew word. There was no English equivalent for that word, so they just used the Hebrew word. Ar or ar are told, er aret. And really what the word means in Hebrew, are or or, is the word for light. And are or told means light has come against light to create a friction for a brand new start. That happens in you all the time. So most of you find yourself on Mount Ararat where the light in you is struggling from with the light that's from without you to give you the power to start over again. That's what the word means, Ararat. You know, don't take my don't take my word for it. Do your own research and find out. That's what the word means. So there's it's not about a boat on a mountain. That's what we're always it's talking about you in the mountain of your problems at this time at this time in your life. And there's not a one of us that's not there. And what is it saying? It's saying, look, right now is the time for a fresh start. Don't be afraid. <laughs> Fear not. Why? Because, you know, God, God's going to put you through and take you over. But this word, Satan, is used 19 times in the Old Testament Scriptures. 14 of these 19 times is found in the first two chapters of the book of Job. And I ain't found a preacher yet that has any understanding of what that's all about. It's just ridiculous what they come up with. So you can see three-fourths of this word Satan is used. And actually, and you can go back into Chronicles. It's used in Chronicles. It's used in Psalms. And it's used in Ezekiel. It's five other times in the Old Testament. And every time you'll find it used, it's where God sent Satan to do something. That's right. You won't find Satan in Genesis chapter 3. Now everybody does have him there for some reason or have it there or whatever, but they don't even know what it is. Most people ain't got a clue what in the world is that. Well, actually the word Satan is adversary in far as definition, but what it really means is whatever comes into the temple of God, which is you, you have an immune system, which is your satanic system, that's adversary to any virus, to any flu, to any cold, to any bacteria, to anything coming against you and coming into your body. And you have it all the time. You can't not. Children do it right from the get-go. These little kids, they're crawling around with their hands, and the, where does that hand go? They put it on everything, everywhere, and where does it go first place? <laughs> kids are picking up viruses and... Uh, bacteria and germs and every, all the time and you can't keep them from it. But they have a fresh immune system because of, especially if they breastfeed, they have an immune system that will just put them to completely over most anything that comes against them. That's their satan because satan is that which is adversary against anything coming toward them. And that's its usage. That's exactly how it's used here. So, Job chapter 2, verse 7, So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord. That's how it will always be. That's how it, it doesn't mean that he's fleeing from God's presence because you are what the presence of God is. It goes forth from you. Why? Because it's that adversary against the, the Canaanites, Hittites, Jebusites, and all the other demonites. <laughs> or anything adversary coming against you. 
Now, if that's strong in you and it's working like it should, then you will be strong and you will combat whatever it is coming at you, coming against you. So it sanctified forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with the sore bulls, da 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 and he took him to a pot shred to straighten himself, da 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 And then said his wife, then said his wife, then said his wife, that's this word right here, Asha. You remember, I told you, actually, there is only one place in the Old Testament Scripture, only one place where this word wife is found. And if you will go with me to Genesis chapter 20, I'll show it to you. Only one place in the Old Testament where the word wife is actually found, even though you find in the English translation the word Asha, you'll find it many times. Genesis chapter 20. Look at verse 1. And, and you know, a lot, of, a lot of preachers have really been confused about this passage of Scripture. And it says in verse 1, Genesis 20 verse 1, it says, And Abram journeyed from thence toward the south country and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur, and so journeyed in Gerar. And Abram said unto Sarah, his wife. Now, actually, this word wife in Scripture is Baal. Baal. B-A-A-L. Baal. It's only one time in the Old Testament that it's actually used. Baal. And actually, the word means master. That's what it means. So, and it sounds pretty true too, don't it? If you say to your wife, yes, master, I will. <laughs> Kirby's good at it. Yes, dear. <laughs> yes, dear. <laughs> the word for wife, I'm, I'm talking, you know, look it up. Do you some research. i get you a concordance or find out. Look it up. The word wife is Esha. And it's always referring to the feminine <coughs> side of your brain. That side of your brain that incubates the thoughts. This word is Baal, and it actually means master. That, I mean, that's the, that's the major meaning of the word. It, it actually means master, or it actually means the one who has dominion. <laughs> yeah, that fits pretty good, though, for the American country. Yeah, my wife, she certainly does. She got the checkbook and this book and all the other books. <laughs> oh, my so it says, And Abram said unto Sarai, his wife, she is my sister, and Abimelech, the king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. And, but God came to Abimelech in the dream night and said unto him, Behold, you are uh, a dead man for the woman. You see that word woman right there? That word woman is again this word right here, Esha. And again, this is a mythological, allegorical, typological story about how your brain, how that part of you that has dominion of creativity, which is your Esha, the feminine side of your brain that will create from the thoughts that you give it, from the Esh, the fire side of your brain. And that's how your physical body works. So it doesn't matter what name you want to call yourself or from what, to what place you find yourself. This is how your body, my body, everybody's body, this is how it works. It works by a divine pattern or plan. And that divine pattern, that divine plan is put in the Hebrew glyphs. Because each of those glyphs, they carry within themselves, each one of them within themselves, they carry their own dominion, their own power. And then when you combine them, then you have a combination of powers and abilities. Not force. Force is what we do when we get in the physical and then we want to make something happen ourselves. That's when we use that's when we use physical force. We use the strength below. And we can do that, and we do do that. And it's I'm not gonna say it's right or wrong, but it's better if you just allow power, allow power. Do you hear what I'm saying? You allow power. In other words, you move out of the way. And let the power of God begin to do. Let Him create. Drive out the fear. Fear has torment. That's all fear is going to do is torment you. Just make you worry. You ever had nights you couldn't sleep? 
Yes. Man, how about it? Why? Because of thoughts just going crazy here and under there. Why? Well, you know, one of the best ways that I that I find to get rid of those those dreadful thoughts is to uh, meditate. And that's difficult because meditation is not trying to just muse over and over and over on a thought. I mean, I, you know, that, I, they taught us that years and years ago. Just take a thought, you know, like, like if I'm trying to memorize certain scripture, I'm just going to memorize a whole book in the Bible. and I just, So I'm just sitting there thinking, 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 thinking on that book. That's thinking. That's not meditating. And too much thinking to give you a headache. <laughs> meditation is to empty your mind. Meditation is getting into this place right here. Medi meditation is space. There's no place space is not. Mm -hmm. now, I can say there's no place God is not. Mm -hmm. Space actually fills everything that there is, and yet it can't be contained in anything. I can say the same thing of God. So again, I'm coming back. Space is one of the best words you can use for what God is. What is God? God is space. Nowhere he's not. He's everywhere. It fills everything. And so when you get into meditation, you get into this place of, of no space. This is that place that I say the best, the, the, the best way I have personally found is breath in through your nostrils, out that way, and put your focus on the sound of that breath and you won't think. What did that breath sound like when it came in? And what did that breath sound like when it went out? And if you put your focus on it, if you just practice it and did it five minutes a day, work up to 10, 15 minutes a day, I will tell you what you'll begin to, you'll begin to find. You'll begin to find the voice of water, the voice of God on the breaths that you breathe. And those, that voice may come to you through intuition, may come to you through a thought or whatever. But just focusing on that, practicing that, practicing, and that'll, that'll drive the fear from you and empower you and strengthen you. And that's what we need. We, right now, we need more than anything. We need to be empowered. Empowerment comes from knowledge. We need to know. We need to know about, more about who we are. We need empowerment, and we need peace. We don't, we don't need to be in fear and torment. So I'll just quit right here. It's a never-ending saga. Just <laughs> goes from one page to the next page. I wanted to actually this morning in my notes, but there's no need to even try to get there. I wanted to go and try to get into Genesis chapter 3 and, and show you what was in Nachesh, the Hebrew word Nachesh. And it got translated serpent. The word for serpent is Sa'ir. Or the word for snake is Sa'ir. You hear the difference? Sa'ir, Nachesh. So in Genesis chapter 3, and it talked about the serpent. The serpent was more subtle. The word for subtle actually means crafty. It actually means your ability to do something more with less. That's what it means. That's what actually it means. And so you're not cash, whatever you're not cash, you find out what you're not cash is. Your not cash is this. I'll show it to you real quickly. I said I wasn't going to get there. But here is your not cash. It is your serpent on the pole that's going up to the, the male, female, and giving the energy and the power back to the whole physical body to be what it's designed to be. That's the serpent on the pole. And, you know, the word nachesh in, in the Hebrew uh, is used, gosh, it's used for quite a number of places. It's not... Satan, it's not uh, you know it's not a lot of the things that we have we have been told. The word nakesh is used in the book of Deuteronomy for the word learn by experience. Have you ever learned anything by experience? Oh yeah. Have you ever had a bad a bad experience mm -hmm. and learned a valuable lesson? Oh yeah. Why did you call it bad when you learned good from it? You were taught to do that. Yeah. Any experience you have, 
If you learn from it, it's valuable. Period. Doesn't matter. It's valuable. That's the nachesh. That's but it, but you see, in ancient material, all of ancient wisdom, what culture, what nation you went to, the serpent was always used as the symbol of um, wisdom. So, you know, when you you see a doctor and he has the serpent on the pole on his diploma, <laughs> right? You see, he has those. That serpent actually represents that wisdom that feeds off Esh and Esha. And feeds Esh and Esha. Right. So that's what Genesis 3 is about. So we were going to get to that, but we didn't. We'll get to that next time. Maybe. <laughs> uh, any questions?